Thank you for joining us for this morning's pottery demonstration with Marlene and Dominic Melchor. My name is Lily McEnany and I am an assistant curator at the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. And for those of you who are familiar with MIAC and our programming know that pre-pandemic we regularly hosted monthly pottery demonstrations in our Buxbaum Gallery. And even though we are now open to the public, of course, we are continuing our pottery demonstration series on Zoom. So stay tuned for details on upcoming demos and other programs by following our social media and signing up for our newsletter. So before I hand it over to Marlene and Dominic, a few things. Um, as always to begin, I would like to briefly acknowledge the place where this conversation is happening, even though we are not physically at the museum today, um, at least on my end, uh, in Ogopoke within the table world. As a non-native person living in so-called Santa Fe, I am a guest in the ancestral homelands of the Tewa people. And I wish to acknowledge all of the indigenous folks, Pueblo, Navajo, Apache, and so many others, past, present, and future, who walk on these lands and steward these places. And I would encourage everybody watching today to reflect on um, the lands on which they reside and how they came to be there. And I know um, Mar Marlene and Dominique have a PowerPoint that they're gonna start us out with today and then they're gonna move into the demo. So with that, I'll hand it over to you all. Hello everybody, good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, like she said, my name is Dominic Melcher. This is my mom, Marlene Melcher. Good morning, everyone. So today we have for you a PowerPoint. Our brand is a, well, I guess you could say, <laughs> Pottery by the Melchers, and we're from uh, Santo Domingo, Pueblo, New Mexico. Uh, all of our pottery is one of a kind, all natural, all traditional. We make it the old way, as I, I say, like how it was made, say, a thousand years ago. And the history of our party of our pottery really goes back. Um, I am a fifth generation potter, and my mom is a fourth generation. So you want to talk about grandma? Okay, um, if our family history all started with um, Maria Garcia. Uh, that was Santana Melcher's mom. And on the screen to your left, um, that's Santana Melcher with a jar that she um, had made when she was young. And to the right is a picture of um, Persita and Santana Melcher. Um, they were invited to Washington, D.C. to represent the 19 Pueblo Potters. And at that time, they were, um, they took um, one of our, each of their potteries to um, give to the White House. And Santana Melcher, a little bit of um, information on her. She never completed her education. Uh, so Cursita went on the trip as an interpreter. So that's how she was able to go to Washington. And Santana stayed home with her mom to, to learn pottery. And at the age of 25 is when she started making her own big pots like demonstrated uh, onto the left picture. And all her, um, then the next photo is of Cursita Melcher. Uh, she started painting pottery with her mom uh, at the age of 18. Then she um, really got influenced when she went, took that trip to Washington, DC. And after that, she's been making pottery full-time uh, up until four years ago when she um, stopped due to her illness. So, uh, but it's mostly due to old age. And we're still learning um, from Cursita at this moment. She's 91 years old now. And so um, we're still continuing to go back and forth with her and getting encouragement and support from her as to how we handle our pottery. And we don't have a picture of my mom, which is Dolorita Melcher. And she, she um, made pottery uh, on her days off. She was a full-time nurse at UNM Hospital. And so when she retired, then she became a full-time potter. Um, but she passed, um, unfortunately, at an early age of 56. And, um, but she would still feel her presence in everyday life as far as encouraging us with, with life itself. And so I'm the 
fourth generation of potters from the Melcher family. And so um, I made pottery as early as when I was five years old and just continue going to uh, visits on um, gathering the materials, going up to the hills um, at a young age. But at the age of 16, that's when I started um, getting encouragement as far as um, uh, painting pottery for my um, aunt. Um, then I retired from my office work of 25 years and started working full time with grandma, which we call Grandma Crescita. <laughs> and so I've been doing it full time since then. But at this point, I'm also taking care of her full time. Um, but she still encourages us every day to continue on with pottery making. And so that's where Dominic comes in. She, he's our um, fifth generation, along with his, my grandson. Um, like she said, or I said, <laughs> I'm a fifth generation potter. And I've been making ever since I was like, I say four, five around then. And I started off with different kind of puzzles just to be, I always wanted to be different, I guess, in the pottery world. And I remember making a Kung Fu Panda and the Cars, the Lightning McQueen character. But ever since then, I always felt obligated, I guess, that one of my purposes in this life was to carry on this tradition for uh, my kids and for my family. And I just always wanted to learn more. So I would be staying at home with uh, my grandma, Prisita, and she would just babysit me while my mom was at work. And even at that little age, before I was going to school, this was before Head Start. And I would uh, just watch what she was doing, watch how she made the pottery and just kind of went, went with it. And so now I am teaching my son. He is, uh, will be the sixth generation along with my daughter. I have two kids. So I'm just really focusing on carrying on the tradition that my grandma set, set back way, way back when. Santana Melcher. And uh, the next we'll be showing you is the gathering and the making of the materials. Right here, what you're seeing is uh, me gathering some red clay. There are two different types of clay that we use. Right here, you're seeing me gather the red clay. Um, when we go to these places, they are very sacred to us. So I kind of just took pictures so that you won't see where it is, but just, just so you'll see the process. Um, so whenever we go there, we're taught to not leave a mark. So as to say, we're supposed to leave it as we, as we saw it when we got there so that it all looks untouched and everything. So we take this process very, very uh, respectfully. And um, right here, you see me on the left, you see me uh, sweeping down the surface. That's just to get the little bits of clay and then we uh, sift it all the way down till it's a, it's a sand. And then all of the rest of the materials that aren't being used, the, the clay that's not being used, we throw back and give back to Mother Earth, kind of as it reproduces and does its thing of sifting it down on its own. But many, many people these days, um, it's a lot of uh, things going on where they're not respecting the land, but we always take, take that into thought to always respect the land. Okay, and over here, we're at the spot where we collect the white sand. It, it's a clay too, but we use, a bit, use it more of as a sand, as kind of make the red uh, stick more, to make a, the clay stick more, and we use that white sand as a temp. And right there, you see me on the left and my mom on the right with the, my, uh, my daughter and, and my niece. They're, we're all collecting the white sand. And with that process, we do it also really, really calmly and really just being at peace with it and not really to disturb the earth. And the next slide is the making of the clay. This is the white sand mixed with the red, red sand, but they're, they're both clays, I guess you could say. It's just, we have our own recipe that, we, that my husband passed down since Santana Melcher. So we kind of use that same method. We always use that same method in our pottery. And then the next slide is the picture of it being mixed. So 
to get that consistency that we want, we just make sure we keep adding water and just uh, mix it the proper way. And then this next slide, this is how it looks when it's done. We roll it up, it's a lot of kneading and a lot of trying to get the air bubbles out so that we have no uh, problems during the firing process or while we're making the pottery. And this, this picture I really like is because you can kind of, you can smell it. <laughs> As you would if on a New Mexico rainy day, you would smell a really good sense of that dirt mixing with the water. And that's that's what it smells like. So now we're at the creation of the pottery and the river turtles. My mom has been doing pottery. She makes more of the, I would say, the traditional bowls and vases. And I started I started making what I call river turtles. I used to love going to the river as a kid, and I still do to this day. I'm still a kid. <laughs> but um I would see these uh, flatback river turtles that I, I never see nowhere else. And I was like, what is that? And then so my brother was telling me, he goes, those are just our turtles that are in the river. He goes, they look like that, but they're turtles. So I was always fascinated with that. So I thought about making um, some uh, flat flatback turtles. So I started off with that when I was younger. And I just felt this is how I could be different in the pottery world. I could create these turtles from all natural ways and uh, put all nat all traditional designs on them and just kind of be different and to run with it. And right now we'll be showing a demonstration of us uh, getting the clay, which we have right here. <laughs> and uh, we're gonna be making some pottery and uh, I'll be making a river turtle for you. And one thing to let you guys know is that it's best that we mix the clay a day before so that it's that we're able to work with it. Yeah, no. yeah. Okay. So I got the clay right here. What I usually start off with is um is making it into a ball. So it depends on what size of turtle I wanna make, but I start off with making a ball. I hear some. We're together. Okay. Same time. Mama. So throughout this process, we're taught to, before we start, we're, we're taught to pray and everything, pray everything comes out good. One of the material, main materials that I feel that we need is prayer. So I, I use that as one of the materials that I put in to when I make the pottery. So now I got a ball. The one I'm creating is the bottom of the turtle. So I press it down. Some paper too. And with the water right here, we we always use these these tin cans. I always saw my grandma using these, and I always thought it was special. So whenever like I would see like food in one, I would always just like at a store. I would always go back to thinking about my grandma and how she used it for the pottery. And for me, I'll be demonstrating a small jar. And what I, what I do is um, all this um, material has been handed down, except for the paper towel. <laughs> I use it to so that it can absorb the extra um, water. When I make my jar, I just put a hole with my thumb and continuously turn it. No. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. OK. 
Okay. So now I have the bottom. Then I get another one, another piece of clay. And then I'll make the top. I always, um, I always loved doing art. I always felt, I wouldn't say obligated, but kind of just like, as it's like my purpose being here on this earth too. Let's see. And then after I, I had a I had a kid young and that was my son Caleb. And so after that I needed a way to make some money as a as a living. But I didn't I was always the type to feel like like I didn't really want to listen to people tell me what to do. So I was like there's another there has to be another way where I can make money on my own. And so I always I just went back to the pottery. I was like this has to be my way that I can at least try to make some living for my son. So that's when I really started to focus on doing it more. And actually around that time was when I started creating the turtles. And what I like about it too is like, if life, if life ever feels like it's getting like too hectic as it always does, <laughs> Once I start doing the pottery, it's like, like I'm in a meditation state of mind where nothing else really matters except for the pottery. So I put my top on and what I do is I just connect it. So it's gonna be hollow on the inside, but when, um, when it's dried, after a couple of days, um, I will make the hole so that during the firing process, that heat doesn't explode the turtle. <laughs> and with the flatback turtles, I just, um, it's kind of, the, it's pretty much the same process, just done in a different way. I feel like th this one takes more time, but I also feel like it is the more well-known kind of turtle. And everybody likes different stuff, so I try to make a variety. Oh, the materials. Hmm. After this, we'll be going back to all the natural materials that we use. I will be showing you how I make a, a brush out of the, the yucca plant, the yucca flower plant. And in my process, I use, still use the coil method. And so I start off with a little base, then I go inward to bring out the shape of the Then once that is all connected with my turtle, that's just its body, its shell. And now we're, I'm gonna add the legs. For the legs, I create little balls also. See about that big. And while I'm making, I'm kind of just like, in my mind picturing what can come out. And we were taught to, anytime we're working with um, pottery, 
as we're creating that we we have it in our mind that it, to make it as to how we would like to use it for our own purposes. So to make it as the best way we can and put all our heart into it. And like Dom Dominic was mentioning, we still have all the materials that were sent down from all the way to Santana. So we still use the gourds to shape out the pottery. Mm -hmm. Then I go inside and just turn the piece round and round till I get a shape that I want. I'm so happy we're all coming out of COVID. <laughs> During that COVID time, we, we kind of had to take a break on the pottery. We, we still worked on it. We did a lot of pottery. But we we slowed down a lot because we could not, could not go do shows or any like anything like that. But now that everything's opening back up, we're really excited to get out and show our work and just get back to it. What's the time on that? Ten thirty. Huh? Okay. Ten thirty. How much more? We have 15, 15 minutes. Okay. Usually I'd say it takes me about an hour to finish a turtle. Just because I try to pay attention to the detail, take my time. Grandma always told me that Patience was a big part of it, and it will teach you patience too. Because if you don't have patience, it'll just crumble down. The main thing is believing in what, you, what you're making and how it's going to turn out, just like anything in life. So with pottery, it takes me back to learning so many lessons. From pottery, I put it into my life. And family has always been a big part of it for me. So I just felt like carrying it on. Let's see. And one thing I want to show you is that there's all different modern styles now. Like um, we try everything. And so this is a modern version of our gourd. All the way to and Grandma Santana used old stuff, just scraps of things. In the modern day. This is a gourd right here. Santana used this. <laughs> and that's a modern one. These are the modern ones. A couple of years back before uh, COVID, I went with my dad to Missa Verde just to learn more about the culture in the past, how it used to be, just, just to learn a lot more. And it was very much needed. I also picked up on a lot of designs because growing up, I always was fascinated into 
how they used to live back then so much that <laughs> I remember one time I was a little boy and I, I ate a big meal and I got a lot of mess all over my face. And so I, I was just some way like, I'm an Indian. And I got the tortilla and I wiped my face with it. And my mom, and I started eating it too. And I was like, mom, they didn't have napkins back then. What were they supposed to use? <laughs> <laughs> so that was always funny to me. And up the legs. So right now we don't have no uh, finished pottery, but we have a lot of pottery that we are working on at the moment because we have a show at the end of the month called Native Treasures. Come stop by the booth for y'all who be who will be there. Everybody who will be there, come see us. And so when I'm in, in this part of the stage with the turtle, I always had to choose which side's going to be the head or which side's going to be the tail. So that's kind of up to me. <laughs> and I, I try to always make the best, the best decision. And then with my turtles, what you'll see at the end is I have a picture of turtles that I made. And I always, on the face, people always put that how would you say that that old way of like making a face, like just let's say the three circles or just a simple way. But what I chose to do to be different again <laughs> was to put a smiley face on it. Just so that when whoever the buyer is, whoever I'm selling it to, when they see that turtle, if they're having a bad day or whatever, it'll put that smile on their face that they needed. So it's all about the love all the time, no matter what it is. Okay. I say we should stop at 35, just so um, we can show them the materials and stuff. It's 40? It's oh. almost 40. Oh, okay. Do you want to stop now? I, I, I kind of think down. we should stop. Mm -hmm. Okay, so during this demonstration, we got this far along. But just because I want to show you some of the more things that we got and the more, more things that we use, all the natural materials, we're going cut to it, cut it off right here. But as you see, I got my turtle and I got the legs on and I got the head. This part right here, that'll go with tail. And so after, after this part, um, it, it's, it goes into a drying process, but at the same time, while it's dry, drying, I uh, scrape it to kind of give it, give it more of that detail. And after that, then it's dried and the sanding process, then after that, we go through with the whole process, which we'll talk about here now. You want to show your part, how far you got? And this is how far I got. And it's now going to be in the drying stage. And But I have um, the wetness in the driver and then the send it. And then this one is the drying part. It's almost completely dry now. Then the send it part. So you send it down to completely take off the rough edges. This is the one that's just dried. And then this is the one that's sanded. As you can see that color difference too. With this one, you can see more of that white whiteness in it, which, which gives us that 
shows that we use bold clays. And then for me, this is my turtle that's drying right now in the process. Another one. That's the hole at the bottom that I was talking about. You always have to make that hole at the bottom. Otherwise the heat during the firing process will make the turtle explode. Okay. Uh, let me see. The materials. Okay, materials. Okay, so like we were saying, all the materials have been handed down and we also make our, well, make our own. With the beeweed, beeweed paint, you have to make it on your own. And so, okay, okay. So right here, these stones, all these stones have been handed down since Santana Melcher. These are all the polishing stones. She used to make really big jars, really big jars. And she would make them for, for the Pueblo. And then what we have here is the, the yucca. I went to go get some just so I could show you guys how to make it. I'm not too sure if we have time, but what I usually do when I'm making my brush is I um I cut it right here at the tip. Let me go get a scissor real quick. Add it back. I cut on the tip just to make it straight or how I want it. And then you bite. And I don't mind it because I'm an Indian. <laughs> and so there, that's just me biting it. What's underneath there is fibers. So with my teeth, I pull all that green stuff off. And then sometimes if that's getting too much, I'll use a scissor. And then you can see the fibers. The white fibers. After that, I cut it. I cut it. To the size that I need in order to paint. This is just a little demonstration because I had to do it quick, but usually I'll make the fibers a little longer so that it goes, slides good on the pot. After that, we have the white slip right here. This is the one that you put in into the water and it just melts, it creates the slip. Right here, when I went to Mesa Verde with my father, they gave me this white slip. I went to a Crow Canyon Archaeological Center. And they have amazing stuff. They're doing so much amazing research. And um, over here, this is the white slip that the archaeologists there believe that they used. And then so this one is our red slip. It's right there by that lava hada. It's nice and red. And we crush that down into a fine powder and use that for the bottom of our pots and for um, to give it that design that nobody really has in the Pueblo. Okay, so once it's all dried, we go through the different processes. Again, this is very sacred to us that we don't share the exact recipe, but more so sure of the stages that it goes through. For, for it all to go through, I would say about a month, a month and a half. Uh, right here, I forgot to show this, but this is the bee weed plant that's made and it's hardened. The beeweed plant, it um, it um, it's a like a wild spinach, and when we boil it, what's left at the bottom is like this tarish kind of texture. With all that tar that's left at the bottom, um, it's the beeweed beeweed paint. We gather it and we put it in this little tamale. 
and it hardens over time. And this will take us a long, a long way. And we and, take off little by little. And just to let you know, even um, with all this, um, just a small rock, this will take us a long, long ways too. It only takes a little bit of chips from this to make the white slip. And same with the paint. It only takes a little chip from here to make, um, make a bowl of um, paint. And with this, my son um, crushes it down to a fine grain. And so then we soak it for a, about a day or two before I can use it. And once at this stage, when it's all fully soaked, then I get used to polishing stones. I think we're the only ones in San Domingo that does the high polish at the bottom of their jars and as well as the in, inner, inner jar. Um, we just learned that from all the way back to Santana that we are to take our time and and it does show in 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 our process that that we did do take our time because the shiny part does show up after we fire. So uh, during the process it goes make we make the pottery after that we uh, let it dry. And then after that, the white slip is applied. After the white slip is applied, the red slip is applied. After those are applied, then we paint it with the bee plant. After that, it's it's we had to put it in the oven to bake a little bit just so the paint sticks a little more. And so um, after that, we uh, it's the firing process. The firing process is out in an orno, and we have a grill right in the middle. I wish I had a picture to show you guys. <laughs> this is our first demonstration, so we, we will be doing more demonstrations and I should have those photos. But um, during that firing process, the grills are in the middle of the orno and all of the wood is placed around. And we are taught, taught to not let the flame touch the pottery as it will crack is what we, we are taught. So during that time, we uh, have the, the grill surrounded with the wood and we, heat, we make a fire. What's left is the coals. Once the coals are hot, we put the pottery in. And then we, after that, once the pottery is in, we add the wood to start the fire back up. But after that, we add cow manure. Cow, cow manure we use as a carbon monoxide in order to make the, the paint more black. Is it dioxide or monoxide? Dioxide. dioxide. Carbon, carbon dioxide in order to make the paint, paint black. And that's, that's how you see the paint turning black after the process is done. Before the process, the bee weed plant on the white slip, it comes out more of a clearish brownish. So uh, you, we're taught that we never know how it's going to come out. So we keep the prayers going. But sometimes it happens to where to where that um, the the mother nature, I guess you you could say the clay admires. the clay the clay lady admires the piece, so she wants it back. So right here we have two pictures of the same pottery that my mom's showing up. It was a really big vase, really nice, but it it turned out to crack during the firing process. I'm not too sure on the temperature that we get it, but we get it really, really scorching hot to where the way we know if the pottery's um, then being fired is the whole, the whole uh, orno inside, it turns black. It all turns black. But after everything starts to clear, these pots actually, all the pots, they all turn black. They all turn black during the firing process while they're in the orno. And then until they cool down is when the true color reveals. And then right now, right here is, we have the finished pottery. These are my mom's pieces that we have right here. And I wanna point out that little opening on the top, that is the spirit line. As a good karma in a way for the buyers and for, for our spiritual ways and that the, the way we make it, is for all the spirits to go, good spirits to go in and all the bad to go out. And right here are some of my pieces. Right here we have that 
that step design that I I got from Mesa Verde and the corn designs, which my dad is a corn clan, and I always saw him drawing corn and being so proud of his clan. And then so I, I decided to put that on my pottery as well. I have many pieces with corn. And right there, we have a big jar that my mom did and one of my turtles. On this turtle, it, it looks like we didn't add enough uh, sugar, but like, like, again, we know, we don't know how it's gonna come out. So they're their own uh, characters in a way, and they do their own thing with how they fire. But sometimes it happens like that, where you can see on the left, left side, that paint is more darker as to the right one. And I always put that smiley face on the turtles. And that was our demonstration. Hope you enjoyed the information. Um, any questions? That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Marlene and Dominic. Um, I loved hearing about your individual practices and how they kind of complement each other. Um, and I also always enjoy the smiley faces on the turtles. <laughs> um, so we have a few questions that have come in. Um, the first of which is about native treasures. Um, so the native treasures market is happening Memorial Day weekend, uh, May 28th through the 30th at the Santa Fe Convention Center. Um, and that event is put on by the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture annually. Um, but this year we're having our first night market, which is Saturday, May 28th from five to eight as well as the day market. Um, so that will be really exciting to see you all there. Um, we have some other questions about materials that I think you answered um, during that last part of the conversation. So thank you for that. So another material question that's come in is from Catherine asking, what is the name of the yucca that you use? I'm not too sure on the English name, but it's it's it is grown around, well, it's grown naturally, it's a wild plant. <laughs> so we we kind of just go collect it. I'm not too sure on the English name. Yeah, I think there's only really one type of yucca in New Mexico. And I think as far as I know, everybody just uses that word for it. Um so I have some, I have a question, Dominic, for you. Um, you say you have two kids who are growing up and you're teaching them how to make pottery. Um, how is that going? And is it, what is that like for you to be a teacher to your kids in that way? Um, it's amazing, actually. Yeah. It makes me, makes life more than what it is, actually. And I just love teaching my son. My son was the first one and he really gravitated towards it. And he would always go with us to the market. So he was always uh, encouraged to do. And this is actually one of his turtles. Oh my gosh. Wow. And he made this in 2019. So this is like three years ago when he was six. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing for, for any age, but especially a six-year-old. <laughs> yeah. And then I have a daughter and she's one year old, so I can't wait till she's ready to go and do everything. But we, when we went to go get the white clay, uh, she went with us and she was so excited. She got so dirty, but <laughs> she was having so much fun. <laughs> Marlene, that must be amazing for you to watch too. Um, yes. Um, it. I, I, my heart just got filled when I took my grand granddaughters. I, I just had boys when I, um, and so it's kind of funny for me to see granddaughters because I was like, I thought Dominic was going to be a girl <laughs> That's what they, uh, the hospital. and then uh, when he was born, I said, it's a boy. Okay, <laughs> but he, he's been an inspiration for me um, to continue on as well as for my grandkids to show them that you can make a life out of this. And it's all due to our grandma, which is Chrisita, that's still living and, and still inspiring us to continue working on pottery. Yeah, and speaking of um, Chrisita, we have a comment from Guy saying that he bought a tiny piece of pottery from the two of you at Indian Market. And he says, I think Dominique was around four at the time. Yeah. Glad to see he and his son are making pottery. <laughs> it's always so much fun to um, do demos with 
pairs. Um, I always so enjoy it and see um, just the incredible ways that families teach each other and learn from each other. It's such a special and unique thing to be able to be a part of in such a small way. Um, so we have another really um, good question from Judith asking about the drying process and how you facilitate that or if it's just do you do anything to make it happen or just wait until the clay is dry? Uh, we basically just leave it um, because our process is no rush no kind rush of because they tell tells us it for a good drying phase is like almost three months so to completely dry so we don't rush it I know some people put it out in the sun put it close to the windows to air dry but we we don't rush it so that it can come out looking good. The clay is going to dry when the clay wants to dry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think that's all for questions right now. Um, we have a, about two minutes left. Um, if you have anything else, last comments um, that you want to make to MIAC audiences before we sign off? Uh, well, I, want, I appreciate um, you know, giving the opportunity at this time to demonstrate and show what we can do and as far as to just promote our work. Um, so thank you, Marlene and Dominic. This has been a spectacular presentation. Um, I'm really appreciative of all the time that you put into this. And I also wanna add that uh, hopefully when the pandemic is over that our, anybody is welcome to our house so they can see our how we do our work and also celebrate in our feast days they're always welcome to the village. That's incredibly kind of you. Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sure our contact information is on there. And if you're really more interested, just contact us, let us know. Way more stories behind all of this and everything. But thank you, everybody, for your time. And thank you for having us. Thank you all and have a great rest of your morning. And stay safe um, for those of you who are in New Mexico with the fires.